Lord to deliver me. The Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you did not know, and a nation that you did not know you shall run to because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. 
The second reading is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now, when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, 
beloved brothers in office, especially you, my dear brother Dave, and your precious Joe, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The prophet Isaiah has a word for us today. He was God's man for a people locked in a crisis very much like our own. God's people Israel in Isaiah's day were in desperate need of renewal and hope. They had grown, grown complacent over the centuries and by Isaiah's time, Judah and Jerusalem, the holy city, were only going through the motions of godliness. Oh, everything looked like it was in fine shape. The temple sacrifices and the sacred liturgy were still performed day after day as prescribed in the law of the Lord. And it was done with meticulous precision and care but they were empty gestures, devoid of meaning. These people, though they knew better, worshiped God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. They had given in to the idolatries and adulteries of the pagans among whom they lived. And so their religion was only skin deep Uh, Israel's godlessness by this time had become system systemic. Idolatry was rampant. And so God took some drastic action to jolt them out of their faithlessness and idolatry. And it was all detailed in the words which God put into the mouth of Isaiah to speak on his behalf. It was not a pleasant message. God's people would be invaded by the mighty Assyrian Empire, and they would be all carried away into exile. Their cities would be utterly devastated, their land laid waste, and only a remnant would be left one day to return. Now, of course, we need to be a little careful about making too many direct connections between ancient Israel and modern-day America and our present predicament. But I think this much is certain, and I believe you'll agree with me, that God often uses great calamity to get his point across. As C.S. Lewis once wrote very pointedly, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. There's just no shortcut from chaos to security. The way out of our mess is the same as it was for Israel, repentance and faith, which brings us, of course, back to our text, which is a good place to be. In the lesson that we heard today, God speaks the inconvenient truth to his wayward people through the mouth of his prophet. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Again, outwardly, things were just fine in Judah and Jerusalem and the land of Israel when it came to food. In the marketplaces, vendors' stalls were full of delectable foods. The fields still yielded their crops in due season. But inwardly, the people were famished. They were starving to death spiritually. They were a mess when it came to God. Their priorities were all out of whack. 
They invested their time and money in all the wrong places. And that's pretty much us too, isn't it? Collectively, we have been spending our money for that which is not bread and expending our labor for that which does not satisfy. You could say we've all been living on borrowed capital, spiritually speaking, and now we've begun to pay a very high rate of interest. These calamities which we've been undergoing of late could be a good thing for Christ's church if they help us sort things out and not just return to business as usual after it's all over, if it's ever all over. This pandemic could be a good thing if it helps us to realize that all the glitz and showbiz that too often has characterized American church life is only empty bling. The one thing needful is to gather together in God's house to hear the life-giving word of the Lord and to receive his sacraments, which are chock full of the life that is in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. All the social unrest and political turmoil, the tribalism of our social media, the screaming heads on our talk shows may ultimately help God's people realize that we've been spending our money on that which is not bread when we ought to focus on Jesus Christ, the living bread from heaven who came down to bring life to the world. Not to be served, as he said, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The life of the church hinges around Jesus, the bread of life. Tend his sheep and lambs with his living word and life-giving sacrament. That's what it's all about. That's where doxology comes into focus. <clears throat> Despite all the reasons that gave rise to holding this event here, I think it's a blessing that this event can be held here in this church. My memory ain't so good, <laughs> but as best I can tell, it was nearly 25 years ago that Bev Yankee and I began a conversation about the care of souls here in Elm Grove Evangelical Lutheran Church. And we hosted so many meetings right down the hall back here behind us in the Bartelt Center Little did we ever dream back in those early days <laughs> that after all the years of research and study, those initial conversations would bear such mighty fruit. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit has richly blessed the work that originated here in this church and now has enriched the lives of thousands of people all over the world as their pastors were strengthened and equipped with tools to enhance their skills as physicians of blood-bought souls, bringing Christ's gifts to hurting and sorrowing saints, and equipping churches just like yours to be beacons of light in an ever-darkening world. What a joy it is then for me personally today to have a part in passing the baton of spiritual care leadership into your capable hands, Dave, so that you and Bev can carry that conversation about the care of souls on into these tumultuous times and beyond. It all began with our gracious God himself from Isaiah to the disciples who gathered up 12 baskets full of leftovers that day that Jesus fed the crowd 
with only five loaves and two fish by the seashore. And on, then on, fast forward into the future to Augustine, to Luther, to Walther, and to this very day. The Lord has seen fit to bring the bread of life through his, to, through his called servants who are engaged in the ongoing conversation about the care of souls. And I believe, Dave, that you are singularly well equipped for that conversation because you know that the topic of that conversation is not you. <laughs> Along with the Apostle Paul, you never preach yourself. I've heard you over the years many times. But Jesus Christ is Lord with you as his servant. An errand boy for Jesus, as it were, bringing out the gifts that he earned by the blood and passion of his cross, his innocent suffering and death, and his glorious resurrection into never-ending life. Though these gifts of Christ's forgiveness, life, and salvation are of inestimable value, they are a wonder of wonders free of charge to all comers. In these dark days of isolation and calamity, of turmoil on our streets and in our hearts, there is still an abundant feast available free of charge to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Here's the way Isaiah puts it. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And we've seen that over and over again in these years in doxology. Over the 12 seasons that we've been at this blessed work in doxology, we've discovered that those who bring the gifts need them too. There are plenty of pastors who are themselves slowly strangling under the burden of ministry, worn out emotionally and strung out spiritually. They themselves need the nutrients of the royal feast they are called to dispense. And I believe that you are singularly well equipped, my brother, to shepherd these starving souls of the shepherds of Christ's church, so they will find renewed courage and hope in the Lord who has called them into his vineyard. For you are a true pastor's pastor, and you are remarkably well equipped to comfort these men with a comfort with which you have been comforted by God. Oh, I'm sure it won't be a walk in the park. There may be days ahead when you wonder what you've gotten yourself into. Because after all, the old evil foe does not like it when Christ's servants are well equipped for service in his kingdom. So you can count on it that Satan will do his level best to undermine the work that you undertake today. But remember, there is one who fights for you that is mightier than he. The Lord Christ, whose servant you are, will strengthen your heart to be valiant in the work of training and equipping faithful sheepdogs of the great shepherd to serve his beloved sheep and lambs in his name and stead. So resting in his mighty word, feasting on his body and blood once given and shed for you, Jesus will himself certainly nourish you every step of the way. So now, the Holy Spirit mightily bless and equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, that in these gray and latter days, there may be those whose song is praise, each life a high doxology unto the Holy Trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. We invite the lectors to come forward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, the Reverend David Clifford Fleming has been properly called by the Board of Directors of Doxology to be Executive Director for Spiritual Care. Hear what the Holy Scripture says concerning the institution of the Office of the Holy Ministry. A reading from Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18 and following. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A reading from John chapter 20. Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Hear what Holy Scripture says concerning the responsibilities of the office of the Holy Ministry. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. A reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. A reading from Acts chapter 20. Take heed to yourself and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Hear what Holy Scripture says concerning the strength and promise God gives to those in the office of the Holy Ministry. A reading from John chapter 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. A reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4. 
Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. A reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, re rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Dear brother in Christ, the Lord grant that you receive and keep these words in your heart that you may be strengthened and encouraged in your labors. It is the mission of doxology to strengthen men in the office of the holy ministry of the word and sacraments. To that end, doxology seeks to renew pastors with the knowledge, attitudes, and skills requisite for this ministry, leading them to display the gifts which the Holy Spirit has endowed them by reverence for God, of faithful use of a word and sacrament, diligent study and prayer, and by adorning the doctrine of our Savior with a holy life. To accept without reservation the canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the written word of God and the only rule and norm of faith and practice. To accept without reservation the ecumenical creeds and all the confessional writings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church contained in the Book of Concord as a true and unadulterated statement and exposition of the Word of God. To manifest an appreciation for and to have a comprehensive understanding of the Holy Scriptures and the skill to interpret them on the basis of the original languages and in accordance with the confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church to exhibit an understanding of and appreciation for the Church's confession of spiritual, scriptural doctrine, and to have the skill to present such doctrine clearly, to show an understanding of and appreciation for God's guidance in the history of the Church, and to have the skill to investigate the Church's past and to interpret it to the present generation to give evidence of understanding the pastoral office as the ministry of proclaiming God's word purely and administering the sacraments according to Christ's mandate for the edification of God's people, teaching them to live faithfully in their vocations, and to indicate a complete dedication to the office of the holy ministry in joyful service. Do you solemnly promise to instruct and guide in accord with this mission? This is my solemn promise before God, who sees and knows all things, and I earnestly pray that he graciously to strengthen and guide me in this my promise. And now address the assembly. You have heard David's solemn promise. Will you now receive him? Pray for him and pledge to cooperate with and support him in this work? If so, then answer, we will, with the help of God. We will, with the help of God. David Clifford Fleming, I install you as Doxology's Executive Director for Spiritual Care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Almighty and most gracious God, we give thanks that you send your people true and faithful servants. Grant to David as he serves in this position the direction, aid, and counsel of your Holy Spirit, that through his labors your church may be nourished, sustained, and equipped for every good work, and built up into him who is the head, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brother, go in peace and joy. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and bless and strengthen you for faithful service in his name.
Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty and most merciful God, your Son's suffering and death won an eternity of peace and joy for your faithful people. Sustain our persecuted brothers and sisters by your Holy Spirit, that they may remain in the confession of the truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal God, our times are in your hands. We give thanks for your servant Harold and for his faithful service. Grant him joy in his retirement and bless him in his holy work as husband, father, grandfather, and continued teacher to your church and her ministers. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
generous blessed are known. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yeah, come over here, John. Uh, Dr. John Willie, the president of the South Wisconsin District. Yes, son. I hope Watch so. Me. Okay. I can hear myself. You can adjust the goose. Okay, thank you. Uh, let I'm me begin by there. saying the Lord be with you. And also with you. It's a great joy to be here on this day uh, as Pastor Sankbile hands off to Pastor Fleming. Doxology has been a great blessing to the church. I think it's, I don't know, don't recall the percentage. We used to know that. I did. Uh, it's well over 50% of the pastors in South Wisconsin have been somewhere in that range, have been to doxology. Hal always called and said, hey, do you have money for this person so you can help him get there? <laughs> yeah, well, it's in our budget every year, but don't tell David Fleming that. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it's been a blessing to the church, and it's going to be a blessing continued. My prayer is that it be a continued blessing as we move forward into this strange world. And you're probably sick of hearing the strange new world phrase, as I am. Uh, but masks are part of our reality. COVID-19 is a part of our reality. Uh, the church is entering a phase, perhaps, of persecution. Bibles were burned the other day in Portland. I don't think that's ever happened in the United States to my memory before, but when they start burning Bibles, churches aren't far behind. Uh, as we come out of this, I know pastors are, many are extremely stressed. Uh, and doxology, I know, is putting together a program to help with that. So I encourage you, don't miss a step in this. Uh, you're a great blessing to the church. Uh, I know a lot of the, the South Wisconsin guys that are here, I know most all of them, have been to doxology. I don't know anybody there sitting up front here that hasn't from South Wisconsin. So thank you. David, we're here to partner with you to help you to assist you in any way that we possibly can. Just like we've been a partner in the past with uh, doxology with uh, Hal and Bev as its leadership. So thanks to doxology, blessings to you. You have us as good partners. Blessings. This time we invite uh, Deaconess Pamela Nielsen forward. She is our uh, acting chairman of uh, the board of directors for Doxology. Hello. On behalf of the board of directors of Doxology, I want to just thank you all for coming, for being part of this special day in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a rainstorm, on a summer Sunday afternoon. I know some of you came from a distance and some of you live close, but we thank God for you and for your support of doxology. And um, I guess I just wanna say, not only have you taught pastors a deeper pastoral care for their flock, but as a pew sitter, doxology has taught me how to receive that care and to look for it and to expect it. And uh, that's something I think about often. And so thank you for that um, and for the continual strengthening that you do of pastors and thus the church and the saints who come to gather around what you have to give us. So, um, but as we look forward in this grand way to our new executive director. Uh, I'm sorry, Hal, you're gonna have to get up one more time. Um, we broke your command and um, we need to, <laughs> we need to um, do some board business here. First of all, the board of directors has officially appointed you director emeritus of doxology. That makes, <laughs> That's right, and all the privileges pertaining there, too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, 
We've also appointed you uh, as the founding and founding director and ongoing director of the Collegium Fellows. And uh, so we have here for you uh, mostly to look at today um, <laughs> because your fellows uh, want to present this to you when they get to gather again. And this is the medallion. And so we wanted to <laughs> let everyone see. Yeah, it's on red. Now, for those who don't know what this language means, the Collegium is a group of graduates of doxology who have been, for the last four years ish, <laughs> uh, helping us in leadership capacity and serving as chaplains, and probably most importantly, uh, developing resources for the current times and consistent with the scriptures and the longer heritage of the pair of souls. Uh, so uh, through this avenue of this working group, you, I might say doxology gives a legacy uh, to the whole church, uh, by the way, not just to the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. We have our own journal, and so that is read widely around the world. And uh, you have touched my heart with this. This is... Uh, uh, a deep honor for me. <laughs> these uh, these men are uh, and just a treasure, the Collegium Fellows. And to be one of them now is, is really something. So thank you. That's right. And that, that's part of the vision, uh, to raise up new leaders and sales organs in the church, right? Uh, and, and wait, there's more. <laughs> a, a little more. Um, since your 45th anniversary in the ministry, your fellows have worked uh, to gather uh, theological essays into a festschrift, and you've waited and waited, and we've waited, the church has waited, and we were so close to being able to give you a printed copy, but it's at the printer. And so that's pretty good. <laughs> and um, so that's coming soon. Uh, close words and harsh shoes. So, yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, thanks be to God. Uh, I hope when we, when we finish here we could sing the common doxology, but uh, you too may have some things to say, new and old. So I'll get out of here. <laughs> so I, I just want to thank Hal for his incredible pastoral leadership of doxology and his care for me. I, I remember when Paul Grimm was installed at St. Paul West Dallas and you preached that we were stewards of the mysteries of God. And that always stuck with me. It changed my whole look on what I'm about. You've been such a gift to us. We're very thankful for you. Do you, do you want to say anything to these nights? I'm going to say you're very kind to remember one of my sermons. I don't remember hardly any of them. So uh, thank you for that. And um, it's a great joy. Uh, I often say that in the ministry, we are part of a team. And we are a relay team. We pass the baton one from the other in each generation. And uh, so those who went before us, I think it was G.K. Chesterton said that the Christian church does not disenfranchise its members because they happen to have died. <laughs> and uh, so it is a noble task. None of us are worthy of it. And uh, so I'm just thrilled that the Lord has led you to this position and pledge you my support and prayers and whatever counsel I can give. Um, so let's uh, stand and sing the common doxology before we sing the closing hymn, since the, my boss told me we have to do that. 